Isaiah 45. If I were to tell you and introduce our subject uh, tonight, just as uh, what it is in, in the basic idea of it, as uh, what uh, the Bible says, or bibliology regarding man, his creation, uh, and his fall, the consequences of that, uh, you might have difficulty except maybe trying, if, you, if we talked about it for a little bit, we might be able to start to make some connections uh, as far as applications beyond just the fact that, well, because of that, we need to preach the gospel. We need to get the gospel to people. But if I were to introduce it this way, if I were to say to you, what is the answer to the question? If evil exists, and it does, how can there be a good, all-powerful, and wise God? If I were to ask that question, if I were to ask that question, a very common question, well-known question, and question used by those who reject the existence of God, they use that as an argument, then that really might pique our curiosity. If we talk about the origin of evil, sin, bad, and the ramifications of that, if we're, if we're not sure how far that goes, how many people do you know that have struggled, possibly even Christian people, with the existence of evil around them or that has taken place maybe in the life of a loved one or the loved one themselves or and, and, and just the effect that that's had upon their own soul? Uh, we know of people who really are in positions today where they um, deny God or say they have no certainty regarding the existence of God because of the existence of evil. And I am sure that if we think through our connections with people, we could come up with believers who have really struggled that God has allowed evil to take place on a personal level. Well, what we're looking at is going to tie into that. We're here in Isaiah 45. Just let's look here. Let's look at Isaiah 45, verse 5. This is a very common text. I think it's important that we just understand it. I am the Lord, verse 5, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the, uh, from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Is... Jehovah God, the creator of evil, moral evil. Is he the creator of evil? Well, some might take this verse and try to point that out and then try to discredit God at least. But if you look at the text, really what we're dealing with here is the counterpart to peace. Just like I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. It's not talking about moral evil. It's not talking about transgression. It's not talking about that which is against the moral, moral character of God. It's talking about that which is contradictory to peace. We have something very similar over in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, where it talks about, can there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? Well, the context there is the very same kind of context here. It's talking about uh, bad coming upon the city. Uh, it's not talking about a moral, sinful transgression 
that's coming upon the city at the hand of God, that he is the actor of sin. That would be wrong, be a wrong conclusion. We say this in our statement of faith. This is our What We Believe series. Man, we believe that man was created in innocence, but by voluntary transgression fell, in consequence of which all mankind are now sinners. I'd like to invite us to turn over to Genesis chapter 3 and spend some time here, kind of use it as just an outline for some of this. And I'm just going to go down through this pretty quickly because I really want to get to the application. That's what we've been doing with this study is we've been wanting just to touch on what we believe, get some sense of a bibliology, what the Bible teaches about that, but we really want to understand how we should apply this, how we should respond to this. Now, our first point is simply this, the creation of man, the creation of man. I I said chapter 3. Let's look back first over at chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 1 in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls, the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon uh, the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, in which is the fruit of tree yielding seed. And and to you it shall be for meat. Now, if you go over uh, to chapter 2, you're going to see there that uh, just an expansion of that, And we're not going to read the details of the creation of man from the dust of the ground. That's found in verses 4 down through verse 7. But if you look here at verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we understand that. And then we understand, uh, if you look down at verse 16, what the Lord gave as a direct instruction to Adam. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So we have this tree of life over in verse 9 of chapter 2, and over here in verse 17 we have this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then we have all the other fruit trees, everything else that's edible. Well, let's understand this. First point, the creation of man, the creation of man. Subpoint A, created by God. And we understand this, that it was a direct creation by God himself, man from the dust of the earth, woman from the side of man. In the text, it's interesting. We're not going to go into detail, but it talks about how he was created. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. Not talking about a physical likeness. We're not to think in that respect. But in spirit, there's a spiritual capacity to commune with God. In soul, there's a personality, a conscious conscience, a self-awareness. And in his role, he has dominion. That's all within the context of what we just read. But then he was to be a procreated being. In other words, the first were created, but from that point on, he, it was to be procreation. All mankind, in other words, descended from the line of Adam and Eve. Now, we, we understand that, but there's an implication to that. The implication is that we are a single race with one racial head. Single race, one racial head, Adam. It's very important. But then secondly, not only created by God, but created, sub-point B, without a sin nature and in innocence. The sin nature, speaking here of the fact that they had no governing power or force in their spiritual or physical being which compelled them to sin. That would be totally foreign to any of us here. That would be absolutely foreign to us. We are born with a compelling force in us, drawing us to sin. 
We were born that way. If we were to all of a sudden, if that was all of a sudden to be totally broken from us, not only broken, but totally removed, in Christ the power is broken, but there's still the possibility. Here, it didn't even exist in them. So there was no sin nature in them, and they were in innocence. Innocence speaking that they did not have any sin guilt, they did not have any moral, spiritual, or physical impurity, they did not experience any corruption. No corruption at all. But then thirdly, they were created with an individual will, an individual will. In other words, God created man with a will, and upon that will, he gave a responsibility. We just read that responsibility, right? Now, that is the setup of the creation of man, and we all fully understand that. Sometimes I think that we somewhat might put ourselves back in that position and might look upon ourselves or others as in innocence and without the sinful nature, without any sin guilt, having this pristine moral, spiritual, and physical purity in us, but this is reserved for these two up to a certain point. Then we have this, secondly, the fall of man. Look over here at the fall itself in chapter 3. We know this, the fall. We could take easily a whole sermon and go into this, but we're just going to touch on a few points. It says here in verse 1, we're going to read the text, and then we're going to touch on points. The fall itself. First of all, notice the role of Satan. Now the serpent was more subtle subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall thou touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil." Important verse 6, and when the woman saw, and you see these different elements working now, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. They did that in innocence. They did that without a sin nature. In the full light of God's presence, and pristine creation and personal fellowship with God. They made a choice of the will directly, in that state, directly against God's command. And so here you have the role of Satan, you have the role of Eve, and you have the responsibility of Adam, and it says this, in the latter part of verse 6 again, and he, she took of the fruit thereof and, and, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice this, then, the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So you know what follows, how the Lord confronts them. He makes these, uh, this covering for them, and so on. So this is the fall itself, but now let's look at this, the consequences of the fall. Okay, that is the fall. Something radical now has happened in them. It's known because of the immediacy, the immediacy of recognizing a moral issue in respect to their own nakedness. Immediately it was known. There was something in them that was transformed at that point. Notice the consequence of the fall. If you look at chapter 3 now, a little bit later, this is after the Lord deals with the covering and so forth, and he's going to now confront them. And let's go up to the confrontation in verse 10. For, uh, verse 9, the end of that, where art thou? God calls out to Adam, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman <coughs> whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And now here is the consequence. Okay, We had the immediacy of that one, but here is the judgment of God. Verse 14, 
This is the consequence of the fall, first of all, the curse upon the serpent. That's subpoint one under point B, the curse upon the serpent, verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, uh, shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. This is interesting. It is, it is the serpent was possessed and used by Satan, possibly voluntarily given himself to the to that demonic being. And now from that point on, there will be a change in this creature created by God. It is a testimony to what took place. We had lots of snakes in Cameroon. I think it was about a it was about a 14 month period of time. We had a, about nine snakes in our yard, and if you think, well, you know, nine snakes, you have gar you have these little, you know, these snakes in the garden, and they don't do anything. Well, these were, you know, one little baby pit viper, spitting cobras. You know, these were not minor snakes, uh, and they had to be confronted and they had to be killed, and. Uh, we go and tell some tremendous stories. I don't know if I'll be able to find myself back on target here, but just incredible snake stories. Okay, Musa. I just got to tell you about Musa. Musa was our guard. This guy, I think he's probably in his 60s, very petite, thin man. He was a Fulani man. They're mostly known for being herdsmen, cattle herdsmen. And uh, he had a sauru. I don't know if you have a sauru, but if you have snakes in your yard, you want one. It's a staff about this, this long, and it's a certain kind of tree. It's pretty thin, maybe about a little bit bigger than my thumb. Uh, but it's made out of a certain kind of wood that just doesn't break. I mean, not it will eventually, but it just doesn't break easily, and it's very strong. And it's the, the kind of uh, instrument a uh, cattle herdsman uses to whip the backs of cattle to keep them going down the road. So, I mean, this thing's strong. They, they get it from up a little bit farther north in Cameroon where, where we were, and they, just, they, they, they walk their cattle li literally, you know, hundreds of miles all the way down to the capital, and they sell them along the way and so forth. And they're whipping these cattle. Well, he had one of those. <clears throat> I had one too. But I was no good with it. I can tell you that much. For me, I would have to take that sauru, and I'd be like hitting all over the place and, you know, maybe getting the back of the snake and, here comes Musa, and I don't know what he did. It, it was probably something, if I wasn't so absorbed with the spitting cobra at the moment, I could have enjoyed what he was doing next to me. But it was almost like he took that sauru, and he, he, he I don't know what he did with it, and then he just he comes around in some smooth motion, and whoop, bam, and hits that thing right on the head, kills it. Boom, I'm over there, I mean, I'm, I'm just torturing the thing, you know, breaking its back here, breaking it here, breaking it here. And he just put it out of his misery. It was very kind of him to do that to that poor snake. Well, every time we see a snake, it is a testimony to this event. It is a physical testimony to the fall of man. That is literal. You can take it figuratively. As the snake was cast down, so Satan was cast down. As the, as the snake would then have to crawl among the dust of the earth, Satan would go to the abode of the dead eventually. In any case, it's a curse upon the serpent, but there are reflections that there's something behind that serpent, and it is Satan himself. Then you have the curse upon the woman, and unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, verse uh, 16. I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse, yes, 16, I'm sorry. Unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There, there's, there's lots here in this verse. There's an amplification of the pains of life, of the difficulty of birth, of the sorrow of children. What is it to be a mom, and now you're giving birth, instead of giving birth to perfected or perfect innocence, you're giving birth, as we find in Genesis 4, 1 and 8, to a murderer. 
What kind of sorrow will that bring to a mother? And how many mothers over the millennia have known the sorrow of seeing their children go away from God and all that that would bring with it? But then also there's even these struggles in marriage that are referred to here. And a really just a a desire for, for ruling over yet being ruled upon is the idea. And then you have this, the curse upon the man in verse 17 and through verse 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, <coughs> till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Well, it's interesting here. This, it touches on this. Did you notice something here? What's the first element of the curse that's mentioned to the man? Did you see this? Cursed is what? The ground. Okay, now wait a minute. I thought man sinned against God. How does creation come into it? The created universe, the created matter, earth. How does that get involved? Well, in the text, it's evident that the curse due to the fall of man is now going to be upon creation. Well, How far does that creation extend? Is it just the weeds we're talking about? Yeah, I keep seeing weeds pop up. It's my nemesis out here in this playground is these weeds keep popping up. I've sprayed it, I've sprayed it, I've pulled them, I've pulled them. They keep coming up. makes good time for meditation and prayer. (laughs) I don't know if that did that for Adam or not. But what we have here in this text, it even says this in uh, Romans 8, 21 and 22, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What's the implication of of these verses? You put these verses together with the other verses throughout the word of God, it's not just the weeds, it's the entire earth. And it's not just the earth. It's the entire universe. How big is the universe? How far out does it extend? It seems that with the more advanced telescopes and way of really reaching out and seeing what's there, it seems that it is just a magnificent display of the eternal nature of God of his infiniteness. It just displays that. It's amazing. They can't, no matter how far they go, they keep seeing more. It is all, it is all under the curse, all of it. Because of what this man did, all of it's under the curse. Then there's the difficulty of work, talking about that with the sweat of the brow, but we know, and you know very well, both men and women, you know, the challenge of labor, of work. But then there's this sentence of death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. We're not going to comment much on that. We have before, but it's not just talking about a physical death. It's talking about spiritual realities and eternal realities. Then we have this in the fall of man, point C, deliverance from the fall. Verse 15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Very simply, there isn't a full disclosure here, but this is the first gospel message. This is it. Isn't it interesting that the first gospel message is mentioned in the midst of the judgment and the curse upon man and all creation because of man's sin? It's right Judgment for man's sin, and right in the midst of it is the hope of the gospel. It's right there. 
It is going to be from the seed of the woman. It is going to be for the destruction of Satan. You could say this, from the deliverance of all that which took place here. And it's going to be by the means of a wounding. Now, this is what we believe, and this is what we hold to when we say we believe that man was created in innocence, but by voluntary transgression fell in consequence of which all mankind are now sinners. So, how should we respond to these truths? Let's go down through that, and we're going to make some closing applications. Number one is to reject all non-creation accounts of man. Categorically reject it. Uh, that is an absolute necessity for us to even go any further from the first pages of Genesis, is to reject everything that's contrary to the fact that God created man in his own image. But secondly, I, this is really I wanted, where, where I want us to start to land. Secondly, not only reject all non-creation accounts of man, but secondly, to accept personal responsibility for sin. To accept personal responsibility for sin. And then thirdly, and this is where we're going to go back to our introduction, introduction reject blaming God for evil. Reject blaming God for evil. Just within the context here of Genesis chapter 3, what were the consequences of sin? If you bring in Genesis 3 with Genesis 4, you can, you're going to see more. <clears throat> the sorrows of life, the difficulties of relationships, natural disasters, both global and cos cosmic, the hardship of work, health problems of all sorts, and death. All that found within what we have here. All that evil found, and there's one source, and it's not God. You have a natural disaster. That's not God's, that's not God's fault. It's a consequence of our sin in our racial head, Adam. And there have been terrible diseases that have gone and just killed millions of people throughout the world. Why? Why? Don't ask why. The question is not why to God in the sense that he has responsibility. Man is responsible for every one of that, every bit of all this and more. This just expands out. Man is responsible. We're going to talk more about that in our closing. Accept Jesus Christ, the only deliverance for the forgiveness of all sin, deliverance from Satan, eternal life with him, and transformation of heart and act. And then lastly is eager, accept Jesus Christ as the only deliverance, and then eagerly anticipate the new heavens and the new earth. And I love this, and this really points back to how all of creation, even unto the ends of the heavens, have been touched by this curse because it says this, in 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, whereby the heavens shall be on fire and shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens, for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. To get the righteousness unto the extremities of the heavens, of the celestials, far beyond anything any telescope has yet seen. To get it there, it all has to be destroyed and remade. And it's all possible as Jesus comes back and at that great judgment, all is destroyed and the new heavens and the new earth are made. Now, listen to this out of one. This is out of a Christian website. This is in conclusion. This is out of a Christian website. And he's trying to answer and wrestle with this problem of the existence of evil. And listen to what he says. And, and this is really quoting from the side or, or really bringing up the point of the person who rejects God because evil exists. There's the philosophical problem. What is the relationship between creation, sovereignty, causation, freedom, and moral responsibility? 
God is all wise, all powerful, and all good. Why then does evil exist? The unbeliever who uses this argument really says, if, if God is all wise, all powerful, and all good, why does evil exist? And they use that to turn and say, evil exists and we know that, therefore what? God doesn't. That's their argument. Well, let's be very clear. Here's the answer to those questions. Due to the fall of man, due to man's sinful choice, our racial head and all of us in him, sin and the extension of that, all that is bad and evil are inherent both in mankind and in all of creation. You see where we're starting? Why then does evil exist? Due to the fall of man. And I'm going to read this. I, I tried to work through this statement very carefully, so I'm sorry that I'm reading so much here, but I think it's very important. As God is wise, all-powerful, and good, he is able, both by his power and wisdom, to make evil work for the good of man, for the glory of his name, and for the accomplishment of his eternal purposes. Do you believe that? That is absolute. Because God is wise, all-powerful, and good, he is able by his power and wisdom to make evil work for the good of man, for the glory of his name, and to accomplish his eternal purposes. But we need to go farther than that. As we said, the reason why evil exists is that is the consequence of man's fall. From the point of man's fall forward, according to what we find in Scripture, from the point of man's fall forward, that evil, the sin, the bad, the evil, plays a necessary role in fulfilling God's eternal purpose without which such would not be possible. In other words, the existence of it It's man's responsibility. It's man's fault. The necessity necessity of its existence from that point forward, God who is all wise, all good, and all powerful to accomplish his eternal purposes, it must exist. And he's going to use it. Have you ever seen God turn evil, sin, or bad in your life or the life of a loved one into your good or their good, his glory, and to accomplish his purposes in and through you or in and through them? Have you ever seen that? That's what God does. That's what only God can do. Only God can do that. God uses evil of which he is not the cause to bring people to eternal salvation. That's his eternal purpose, as they would be saved. In his great wisdom and goodness, the existence of evil that's caused by man continues, and he uses that through which people come to Christ, apart from which it would not happen. God uses that to bring them to a saving faith in Christ. What is the proof of God's wisdom, power, and goodness in the face of the fall of man and the existence of evil? Just just follow this quickly. The removal of Adam and Eve from the garden, that was God's wisdom, goodness, and his power. To remove them? from the place of personal fellowship with him and to take them and to put them outside, how is that good? Because there was a tree there, the tree of life, and he in no way wanted them to eat that in that state. 
That's God's goodness. That's God's wisdom. That's God's power to assure they can never touch it. How about this? The orchestrating of evil for man's good and God's glory. Take the example of Joseph and his brothers. What is it that brought Joseph to Egypt? Evil, sin, bad brought Joseph to Egypt. What did God do in his wisdom, in his goodness, and in his power through that? He saved the entire family, really the entire nation of Israel. What about this? The provision of a Savior who was both God and man and who suffered a sacrificial death for the salvation of men, for the destruction of evil, for the establishment of his eternal absolute rule as God and King. Jesus Christ. In the face of evil, sin, of bad, Jesus Christ is a display of God being all good, all powerful, and all wise. The salvation of one sinner and the salvation of all who will be saved. The Holy Spirit sent into the world to bring sinners to salvation in Jesus Christ. The word of God, the existence of it, of the gospel which is proclaimed, these are all demonstrations of that. Now, how can we appreciate all of this? How can we appreciate God's goodness, wisdom, and power in the face of this evil by embracing this truth and accepting it, that we, that we are the guilty ones? Why does evil exist? Because of us. It is our fault. It is our blame. It is upon us. No matter how bad the catastrophe, no matter how bad the disease, no matter how bad the wicked act that's carried out, it falls on us. We were all in Adam, our racial head. We all bear that guilt that responsibility. It's upon us. God has responded and is responding in wisdom, goodness, and power to our rebellion, our sin, our hardened necks, and our unbelief. Why, or I'm sorry, what is the reason for these acts of wickedness, these acts of horror? It is due to us, not God. God in his love is using all of these consequences to draw people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, to bringing people to God's provision, God's answer, God's demonstration of his wisdom, goodness, and power. God's response to our sin is this one person, Jesus Christ. So here it is. What is the proof that God exists in the light of the existence of evil? Okay, evil exists. Let's turn the question around. Evil exists. What's the proof, the evidence that God exists? A God who's all powerful, all good, and all wise. What's the proof of that? One person, Jesus Christ, satisfies that answer entirely. Entirely. So as we come before those who would ask questions and doubt God, it is that they are laying blame to him when they are the guilty ones. God is all good, all wise, all powerful. There have been ways that God has used the existence of the con- and the consequences for which from, for which we are guilty that is sin and evil and bad he has used that throughout the the centuries for the good of men for the salvation of his souls for the glory of his name and to accomplish his eternal purposes and the climax of it all is Jesus Christ let's pray father we do thank you for your grace and thank you for this time that we could have in your word tonight.